This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I'm going to review for you some aspects of uh, staging of the neuroischemic limb. For some, this may be a new term. I think uh, if I was to translate it to you, it means uh, why we have to consider the diabetic in the staging of the CLI patient. I have no disclosures uh, regarding uh, this talk. Uh, our group recently uh, put out a issue uh, that sort of highlighted multidisciplinary approach to critical limb ischemia, and many of the faculty from UC San Francisco uh, contributed uh, to this. And uh, it has an, uh, a follow-up article from Dr. Mills uh, that is more specifically uh, generated to uh, critical limb ischemia patient in the use of uh, the Society for Vascular Surgery uh, classification system. And also has, I think, a very interesting article on the assessment of foot perfusion uh, from, uh, from the group at Yale and Dr. Sumpio that I'm going to uh, reference uh, in this talk. So there's a number of staging schemes uh, for people that have the ischemic limb and particularly the CLI patient, which is the most severe form of peripheral arterial disease. The Fontaine system was introduced uh, more of as a clinical uh, assessment and had two categories in what we would term as the critical limb ischemic category. And what the Rutherford system did was add uh, physiologic pressure measurements. That was really the big difference in terms of uh, the categories of four and five with tissue loss and then uh, the category six, which means the non-salvageable foot. So they tried to add some staging in terms of what would, what would be necessary to put someone in a category. And this has been used as, uh, as um, inclusion criteria in studies. And as to some extent, Rutherford has been used for outcomes, that you can move from one class to another, whether or not that's uh, valid. And then, uh, as Dr. Owen said, we had the prevent three risks score, which predicts amputation-free survival from very from five easily obtained clinical variables that that's been uh, validated. But I think people are looking at the value of the SVS threatened limb score, which allows risk stratification on three factors uh, that uh, are, are important to that limb, that is the wound characteristics, the level of the ischemia, and the severity of the infection. And then I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the assessment of foot perfusion as it may result to uh, angiosome-targeted revascularization. So this concept of uh, CLI was developed by an expert consensus panel actually in Britain. Peter Bell uh, authored that article. and. Uh, brought to the height that this is a limb-threatening condition and that you, it, you, those people have decreased arterial perfusion by pressure measurements. And today we recognize that as the most advanced stage of PAD and it's associated with limb loss and cardiovascular mortality. And it's a growth industry in terms of uh, the amount of patients that are developing this, primarily because of the, the, the growth in diabetes. Uh, but the CLI definition by itself isn't valid to the diabetic patient because of the neuropathy and the development of uh, tissue injury in the diabetic foot with sepsis. So more may need to be done. We heard a little bit about this in Dr. Conti's about amputation-free survival and how certain patients who can't undergo revascularization, the so-called no option group, in many uh, instances do not have that bad of a uh, uh, outcome. 
the mortality, their limb loss is not that high here at six months in the prostaglandin trial or in this group from Chapel Hill where they saw 50% wound healing rate despite uh, having chronic ulceration and no revascularization option with other things that we can do for the care of the patient. And so the recommendation is maybe we do need a more accurate classification uh, to provide analysis of outcomes to evaluate new technologies to compare uh, centers of excellence uh, with uh, other centers of excellence, for example. So this brought about the concept of the neural ischemic limb. And I think the recognition that many vascular surgeons have had into the podiatrist uh, uh, in the audience today, that when, when someone gets a diabetic foot ulcer, that by itself is a limb-threatening condition. And uh, the way I think about it is that we got a certain time frame that we have to fix this problem. You cannot have a diabetic trying to move around on a foot ulcer for months. They are going to lose their foot. And their other foot is going to fall quickly behind. So this combination of diabetic foot ulcer plus PAD, defined as an ABI of less than 0.8, triples the risk of amputation. And, uh, and that, in this article, it, it sort of uh, discusses some of the factors that are related to uh, primary ulcer healing. In other words, the younger people tend to heal. If you don't have renal failure, that's good. Ankle pressure and so forth. And, and I think that comment regarding serum albumin is very telling in itself. Because if you look at just the hemodynamics as we can measure, we can predict the probability of healing of a diabetic foot ulcer. Uh, the higher the toe pressure, the higher the tissue oxygen, the higher the ankle pressure, uh, you're more likely to heal a diabetic uh, foot ulcer. And so in some patients that have this, their ischemia may be minimal and they do not need revascularization, but they may need another, a, a number of other medical treatments in terms of offloading, wound care, treatment of infection, and so forth. We've heard a little bit about this, this risk stratification uh, from the PREVENT-3 trial. And uh, the way I would look at this is that this is validated and it really highlights a group of people that are still at high risk for amputation despite a bypass graft, uh, but it represented only less than 10% of the whole group. So uh, it indicates that the main driving force is the dialysis patient and the people with end-stage renal disease and how we have an incomplete understanding of wound healing and some of the patient factors that's driving the failure to heal despite revascularization in that patient population. So this gets to the, the Wi-Fi classification, which to me, when I sort of read this, my eyes sort of glass over a few times. And, uh, and it's somewhat complicated. Uh, but I think as surgeons and as podiatrists and other vascular specialists, it does make sense. Now, how we're going to actually use this in practice, I'm not really clear. I'm not, I can't say I'm, I'm dictating what the Wi-Fi classification is uh, to the electronic medical record. I have enough problems with compliance as it is that I have to add one more, uh, one more thing to it. But the best way to look at this yeah, and what the committee from the, uh, from the SBS tried to uh, provide is, think of this, amputation risk is related to disease burden. And the disease burden is, involves a number of factors. The wound, and to have an ulcer means a non-healing ulcer, something that's been there more than uh, two weeks. How deep is the wound? Is there gangrene? Where is the gangrene? Does it involve the heel or does it involve the forefoot? All these changes the classification of the wound. And then the ischemia is graded just uh, based on ABI and toe pressure, much like the Rutherford system. I think that's pretty straightforward. Can again go from normal to what we would term for rest pain. Uh, 
with the rest pain typically uh, confirmed by hemodynamic studies, uh, toe pressures of less than 30, tissue oxygen concentrations of less than 20. And then infection is the same thing. It's based upon the depth of the infection, and they haven't really drilled down to uh, uh, the type of infection, the actual organism, the resistance of the organisms. So what doesn't this contain? This doesn't contain certain patient comorbidities. For example, uh, uh, low ejection fraction, malnutrition, renal failure, and so forth. So there's going to be, I think, other things that are going to be highlighted in this classification that results to specific comorbidities, I think, that we can already uh, uh, we, know, we know which ones they are. The object of this scheme is that you can put people into four categories and you can then determine their risks for amputation of that limb with therapy at one year from the very low to a very high category based upon where they sit in terms of their grades of wound, ischemia, or infection. So this has been put, uh, subjected to validation. This is a, a, uh, the group from Greenville, South Carolina, who have written a lot on uh, critical limb ischemia and, uh, and uh, the results of intervention, had 139 patients with foot wounds and ischemia. And uh, they looked at the predicted uh, outcome versus the observed in terms of amputation and uh, non-healing of the wounds. And, and certainly when someone met the criteria of high risk stage four, they had a 40% amputation rate and a non-healing wound rate of 63%. So this theoretical framework that was developed by the committee, uh, which was done in a thoughtful manner, uh, appeared to be valid. Dr. Mills's group uh, in the, this April issue of the Journal of Asker Surgery uh, also looked at this uh, in a group of uh, 200 consecutive patents, uh, patients with the threatened limb and uh, identified that in terms of with intervention or treatments, their limb salvage rates uh, for the various categories. In 90% of all the amputations that occurred in the care of these uh, patients were in the stage four category. And allowed them to then look at amputation free survival uh, based on the category and showed that it was reduced uh, in uh, the stage, primarily the stage four patients. So this is undergoing validation. Uh, at a single center, uh, and whether or not this will hold up in multiple centers or be different, uh, we don't know. We heard a little bit, uh, Dr. Saab talked to us about angiosome-directed revascularization and showed us some data, and I think that's true, that with this particular approach, particularly for non-healing foot lesions, that it's associated with a higher healing rate compared to uh, non-directed therapy. And, uh, and so people have tried to use particularly tibiality angioplasty in a directed fashion uh, to uh, treat, the artery, uh, treat the artery if possible, and he showed you some good examples that it was possible uh, in many patients to do angiosome-directed revascularization. The question is, does it really result in the healing and how are we gonna measure that? So we have available to us today newer studies, not many of them clinically uh, available, but I think as we develop uh, these uh, threatened limb or limb preservation centers, some of the testing as it results to target foot perfusion testing will be possible. Uh, we do TCPO2 at UCSD as part of the wound clinic. And then there's a number of other techniques uh, uh, going from uh, spec scanning into signing green angiography, uh, CT spec scanning with biomarkers, and uh, laser Doppler, uh, which I have experience with but don't use currently. And this is in that article in the seminars in vascular surgery from Dr. Sumpio's group that details this. The object of this uh, is to do we have methods where if we're gonna do angiosome-directed therapy that we can actually say 
we improved, uh, improved the perfusion into the foot where the wound is. So this hyperspectral imaging uh, can predict healing. It produces uh, spatial maps based upon uh, tissue oxygenation. Uh, and it may identify certain perfusion abnormalities in diabetics. So would that be useful in their unloading therapy or in uh, appliance therapy after interventions? We don't know, we don't have some of that data. I think it probably exists out there somewhere, but this is not currently part of uh, the routine practice, uh, 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 at least in my practice, but be interesting to see what the, what the podiatrists uh, say. In designing green therapy is primarily used uh, today clinically for looking at uh, retinal perfusion, uh, but it has been applied for angiosome-directed revascularizations uh, where prior to and following the angiosome you can see changes, and this is an intravenous uh, injection, requires a camera, and it's pretty straightforward. So we're evolving to sort of a multimodal assessment of limb perfusion. Probably one thing that's going to be coming is the use of SPET CT scanning with biomarkers to give us information about regional limb perfusions, and they can even drill all the way down to is angiogenesis occurring in certain parts and, uh, and uh, what's going to happen. But just using technetium flow, uh, you can look at regional variations that are different uh, in a limb here that had iliac stent thrombosis after an EVAR. What about this patient that I showed you a picture of earlier on? He's got a toe pressure of 29. He's got a very pulsatile signal in the dorsalis pedis at the ankle level. And he has two of his three tibial arteries that come down to the ankle joint and then peter out. He doesn't have a pedal arch. What are we going to do for this particular patient? Do we have a treatment strategy for that? I don't know. I don't know. Is this, is this the patient that will benefit from angiogenesis? Uh, don't know that. So anyway, staging for CLI is important, I think, not only for patient counseling, but also for the assessment of new therapies. And I think angiogenesis is coming down the road. And, uh, and whether or not it's going to be used alone or going to be used as an adjunct will remain to be seen. I think the FDA, for looking at a lot of these new therapies in this patient population, are looking at amputation-free survival. Uh, that, is, that is going to be the outcome. Uh, but that revascularization requires some thoughtful thinking to get the best revascularization because in many patients the non-healing rate still remains significant. And current research suggests the angiosome model and targeted revascularization approach may provide better results for wound healing and long-term limb salvage. Thank you. I thought that was a great, a great talk, Dennis. Um, I mean, we spent so much time talking about interventions that we're going to do that I think you have to step back and realize where we are as a field about the basics, you know, staging, imaging, better stratification of the patients, and all these tools that are finally coming out because we've got a broader community of people interested in CLI. If you think about coronary artery disease, you know, they always understand both the anatomy the physiologic effect on the end organ and the patient overall. And that's where we're going. We're going to, you know, three axes, the patient, the physiologic state of the limb, and the vascular anatomy is just one piece. But every conference is 90% focused on the vascular anatomy and is comparing the wrong things to the wrong. So I think ultimately, you know, this is where we need to spend as much effort on this as we do on looking at the outcomes of the surgical and interventional procedures we do. And that's where I think there could be a lot of broad uh, opportunity to, to work together across the disciplines. I just want to make a comment about the Wi-Fi, because you said it is complex. It does look complex, but it's really not that complex, because everybody who practices oncology can do TNM, and every single cancer has four stages. So we can do this. <laughs> <laughs> and they can remember it, we can remember it, we're not that stupid, but um, at the end of the day, I think what the data is starting to show, including some of our own, is we're going to figure this out. We may not need four stages, we may only end up with three. I mean, because when you start to look at how this, and when we get more and more data, it may turn out 
that some of these buckets can be combined. Just like with cancer, you start somewhere and then you try to see how it prognosticates and then you change it and you change the TNM to, or the staging system to make sense of where we are. But ultimately, we need to be able to talk to each other and know exactly what we're talking about uh, for the same patient. So um, I think it's going to get simpler, but I want everybody to look at it and think about it and, and try to use it because I think it, that's the only way it's going to get better. Yeah, that was the point of Dr. Mills's article in that seminars and vascular surgery issue is that for the patient with advanced ischemia, for the true CLA patient based upon pressure measurements, you really can drill it down a little bit better into about three categories.